So we have a lot of technical developments that have transformed this whole process of in vitro fertilization into our abilities to very accurately diagnose which embryos are going to be able to cause a normal pregnancy. By doing this, it's become the ultimate diagnostic and therapeutic process. Uh, for example, when we look at normal fertility, as, as some of the other doctors will describe, we know that uh, normal human fertility is a function of maternal age to a large extent. And as we age as human beings, our fertility declines. And this is a function of the genetics of the embryos that we produce. So as we age, we produce increasingly larger percentages of abnormal embryos. This in vitro fertilization process enables us to see which embryos are normal. And by doing so and eliminating embryos that are not normal, we can significantly increase pregnancy rates, decrease miscarriage rates, and utilize the technology to actually bring about a therapeutic result of a significant improvement. So when, when in vitro fertilization first began, it was considered uh, the therapeutic process of last resort for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, we didn't really understand it very well. And as such, uh, it didn't work very well. Uh, it was a procedure that required a surgical process called a laparoscopy to aspirate the follicles and retrieve the eggs. The laboratories were not really very good places for embryos. Now, uh, egg retrieval is done very rapidly and minimally invasively by an ultrasound process it does not involve a surgical process. Our laboratories are now quite different than they used to be. They are focused on creating an environment that's the best place for your embryos to grow. It's dictated by an air filtration system and an entirely different type of an environment than we have sitting here uh, in a normal room. Uh, the air is different, the water is different, and the process around the embryos are different. We now have what we call mini incubators. We used to have large places that almost looked like refrigerators that would house anywhere to 20 patients and we would open and close the door to look at the embryos and we finally realized that every time we did this it could potentially impair embryo growth. So we now keep individuals in their own separate incubation systems including uh, things that we were alluding to in regard to uh, a new process called an embryoscope that allows us to not only incubate the embryos but also observe them and observe their cell divisions while they're being incubated. So this is a significant advance in the way in which we're able to uh, not only maintain embryo growth but also diagnose issues. We can diagnose problems with the structural integrity of embryos. We can diagnose problems with the genetic uh, makeup of embryos. And by eliminating embryos that are not going to be productive, we minimize miscarriage rates, minimize rates of abnormal pregnancy, and maximize the rates of normal pregnancy. Now, it's asking a question, you know, and, and like any question, uh, this allows us to get the answer to the question. Sometimes we don't like the answer to the question. Sometimes, particularly, in older patients, we may not find that their embryos are normal. And if this is the case, then utilizing surgical and medical technologies to maintain fertility treatments are really not going to be productive. And it would be much better for those patients to move into other areas that will be discussed further, such as ovum donation, um, 
and or sperm donation, embryo donation. But to continue fertility treatments in someone in whom you're not going to get a good result is really not practicing good medicine. So the offshoot and the results of this technology, even if they're negative, even if they're not what we'd like to see, are still useful and they allow us to practice the type of medicine that we really feel our patients deserve. Uh, to be able to give them the most accurate diagnosis and the best results.